Our political inclinations are shaped by our personality. Our personality is shaped by our worldview, right? But is there something deeper? Our first question is sort of exploring why is it that people have differing opinions and that are seemingly grounded in completely different perspectives on things. Now, why is it that you can have two intelligent people who are educated in a particular subject matter, who are each qualified to give a real opinion on a particular subject matter, yet they both come to very drastically different viewpoints. And when we say two opinions, we're not talking about, well, everyone's entitled to their opinion, which just sort of means that, yeah, you can believe whatever you want, which is true, but trivial. And we're also, uh, we're, not, we're not saying that, that uh, anyone should be, any, anyone's opinion should be shut down, but not all opinions are created equal. Right? A person who has a certain expertise in something, their opinion, their viewpoint on the matter is worth much more than someone who has only no clue. Right? If I give my opinion on how to perform a certain dental operation, well, I, my opinion is really kind of worth because I don't know anything about dentistry, right? as opposed to a dentist who, who knows the craft. So what we're talking about here today is how you can have two people that have a, a very keen understanding of the subject matter, but yet, yet uh, have come to two completely different conclusions on any given topic. And p particularly, we're talking about as that exists in politics. And especially on an election year like this year, it's particularly relevant and particularly in people's minds. All right, so we're going to explore the the ins and outs, you're gonna un understand everything about your own political affiliation, your friends' political affiliation, and hopefully we'll be able to bridge some gaps. Because the, the divide that we find today is so broad that even in Western countries, the liberal conservative worldview distinction is so prominent that how do we refer to it? As the culture war, right? It's, it's a war. Of, of cultures, and it's so so different, so so vastly different that. And uh, what studies show is that there is growing not only not only divergence in perspective, but there's growing hostility between the two parties, between the two worldviews. And so we're going to try to uh, see how to make some bridges and perspectives uh, in our discussion today. So first, let's try to understand where our political affiliation comes from. Most people think that their political affiliation comes from the intellect, right? Through my understanding of certain things, I've come to this certain conclusion. However, however, uh, you know, people may say something to the extent of like, oh, well, you should have to take an, an IQ test to vote, right? As if the other side is completely stupid, you're completely smart, and uh, anyone who doesn't agree with you politically is just an idiot. I think any level-headed level minded person in this room can come to the conclusion that you have very intelligent, very high IQ people, and a lot of dum-dums on both sides of the political spectrum. And so, Intelligence isn't necessarily the root of where our political affiliations come from. It's very comfortable for us to believe that we are the smart ones, they are the stupid ones, and if only they're the ones causing the divide because we are right and they're just rabbling in the background. And so, if it's not intellect, where does our political affiliation come from? So there's actually increasing evidence to suggest that it's much, deep, much more deeply rooted in the nature of the person. It's, it's, so, it's, it's not so much the intelligence that, of the person, but it's more grounded in the person's personality. So there was actually a trio of political scientists out of the University of Nebraska, and they argued that the differences between both sides in the political aisle, between conservatives 
and uh, liberals was if it seemed that it was so broad and so unbridgeable, it's because it's rooted in personality characteristics and biological dispositions, meaning that these people are made of different stuff. Their personalities are completely different. And so the reason that they can't talk to each other is because personality-wise, they're very, on very diverse ends of the spectrum. That's, that's what this particular study showed. And it seems that we are predispositioned to have certain uh, uh, personality traits and, and ultimately certain political tastes. What is personality? Personality means it's a unique set of characteristics, of traits, of behaviors that define how a person typically thinks or feels or acts. That's a personality. So this includes things like whether a person is outgoing or shy, whether a person is optimistic or pessimistic, whether they're organized or disorganized. These are personality features. That's what a personality is. And so these are neutral aspects of a person. It's not like one is good. It's, it's not like it's good to be outgoing and bad to be shy or vice versa. These are just neutral aspects that sort of categorize a person. And so what's interesting is that many contemporary personality, personality psychologists say that really you can break personality into five different aspects, and that's how a personality is shaped. Number one is their openness to experience. Number two is conscientiousness. Number three is extroversion. Number four is agreeableness. And number five is neuroticism. And all, all five of those aspects are what shapes our personality, what makes us behave in the way that we behave. Uh, and so the, the full spectrum of personality is obviously something that's very complicated, but it's, it's overall, it's the personal style or vibe that the person gives off. Unsurprisingly, there is a correlation between how one assesses in the dimension of personality to how one identifies politically. So, uh, for example, Jeff Mondock, who's a political scientist, at, he's a professor at the University of Illinois, he says, he says that people who score high in openness, let's call it, in, as, as far as their personality is concerned, and low in conscientiousness tend to be more liberal because he argues that openness equates with willingness to try new things, new policies, not necessarily connected with any uh, uh, groundings in the past, just trying to you know, create new, right? And, he, and this, is, this includes new policies. So openness and not low in conscientiousness is going to be a more liberal person. And so then the opposite, conscientious, a conscientious person, someone who scores high in conscientiousness, means that they are careful, they're meticulous, or they're diligent. And it means that they're governed by their, their conscience. And so conscious, conscientious people tend to be people that are responsible and organized and hardworking. And so conscientiousness often signals a very strong sense of personal responsibility. And so they would say something like, it's not the government's job to help, and, and they would say, it's my responsibility. And so someone who scores higher uh, personality-wise in conscientiousness tends to be more politically conservative, right? That's the way personality sort of works. But personality focuses on behavior. It's an outgrowth of an overall personal worldview that's embedded in a person. So in other words, you have your political affiliation, which is influenced by your personality. But where does your personality come from? Where does, where does that ultimately come from? Because you could have, you know, you ever have uh, two siblings that have very different personalities, have the same genetics, have the same, grew up in the same home, right? But they have vastly different personalities. Well, because your personality is shaped by, going a little deeper, by your worldview. What's a worldview? A worldview is a set of beliefs and assumptions about the fundamental aspects of reality. 
And so it includes ideas like the nature of the world, the meaning of life, uh, the existence of God, morality, nature, uh, human nature. And so it, a worldview, if you want to think about it, is kind of like the colored lenses, like the colored sunglasses of how you see the world. So like if you put on blue sunglasses and now you see everything as blue, well, it's not that everything became blue, but that's the coloring through which you see the world. So a worldview that a person has is the way they tend to look and interact with everything in their world. And so how does worldview influence personality? Well, a worldview shapes the way in which you feel and behave. So let's take, for example, let's say a person's worldview, a person subscribes to a worldview that emphasizes compassion and kindness, which would be a worldview, by the way, that religious or, or spiritual world, a religious or spiritual worldview would be a worldview that, that, that emphasizes compassion and kindness. And so that person then might develop a personality that is more caring and empathetic. So your worldview shapes your behavior, your personality. Um, if someone's worldview is optimistic and they believe that things will generally work out, which is also a religious or spiritual worldview, they might have a more positive and hopeful personality, right? It's, it's, it's what is the root source of our personality. In essence, while personality is about how a person behaves, and feels about different situations, our worldview is the underlying framework that guides why it is that they behave and feel that way. Is that clear? Okay. So our political inclinations, let's, let's just take it from the top, our political inclinations are shaped by our personality. Our personality is shaped by our worldview, right? But is there something deeper? So from a Jewish or a spiritual perspective, there might be something even deeper. And th that really brings us to what we're talking about today, the Kabbalah of political affiliation. Beyond the personality, and then moving deeper, beyond the worldview, that there's certain emotional powers, emotional aspects of soul that we all have that shape our personality, that shape our worldview, and that ultimately shape our political affiliation. And so if we're going to properly talk about the Kabbalah of personality, I want to quickly just define what Kabbalah is and what it is not. So Kabbalah means to receive. And the, the word Kabbalah comes from the Hebrew word to receive, and it's, it's used to describe the collective body of Jewish mysticism. And we've used that word to describe the collective body of Jewish mysticism since the 12th century. And so today, the word Kabbalah has a lot of different meanings to a lot of different people, right? You say Kabbalah, people think Madonna, red strings, water, amulets. It really doesn't have much to do with magic or witchcraft or anything like that. Kabbalah is essentially the spiritual physics of the universe. What's going on behind the curtain and how God interacts with the world. It's the study of that, that God uses to create and govern the grand system that he created. Right? If you want to know how this world works, so Kabbalah will teach you the behind-the-scenes uh, way, the, the whole setup, how it all is orchestrated. And so this wisdom is all cryptically embedded in the Torah. It's from the Torah itself. It's nothing new. Uh, it, it, the Torah itself is called the blueprint of creation that God used, he gazed into and created the world. And so along that line, Kabbalah uh, is, is permeated through the Torah, and a person who studies Kabbalah wants to permeate the Torah into their entire being. They want to exist in a world that views the world as a manifestation of the Torah. So far, so good? It is the spiritual secret, spiritual physics of how reality functions. So far, so good. All right. So it is the foundation of the Jewish faith that in addition to the written Torah text that God gave to Moses, that there was an oral tradition, oral explanations accompanying that.
And so the text of the Torah can be understood according to its simple meaning with the, the, the stories and laws that, that are described in it, or its deeper and more mystical elucidations. For example, for example, there are a lot of things that make you, you. There's the physical aspect of you that makes you, you. There's the emotional self that makes you, you your, and your personality. There's your intellect and your psychology. And then there's your spiritual self. They're all, all together, all coupled together, make you, you. One is not more you than the other. You're not defined only by your physical self or your emotional self or your spiritual self. You are the totality of all of those aspects of self. And so too, when we say Torah, it's not that the Torah exists only as the written literal uh, laws and stories that took place, that there are deeper underpinnings, deeper revelations and secrets that we can delve into in, in the study of it. And so Kabbalah is part of that oral tradition. Now, so far so good. So far so good? All right. Now, we're going to learn some of the, sp the spiritual physics of the universe right now. So when we learn Kabbalah, the most fundamental idea is, uh, is the way in which God chose to, uh, to emanate himself, express himself to his creation. And when God chooses to interact with creation or with humanity, he does so with what we call the ten spheros. This, uh, a, a, a sphera is a channel of divine energy or life force. And so the most fundamental concept in Kabbalah is that God manifests himself, expresses himself through these ten distinct attributes, these ten distinct ways. And so for our purposes, we're going to focus on the emotional aspects. There are three intellectual, Chabad, Chochmah bin Adas, and then there are seven emotional ones that we are going to discuss because this is the source of political affiliation. All right? So the seven spheros, seven emotional attributes that the soul has, number one is chesed, kindness, unbound giving. The second one, gvura, is strength or what would be like fear of God, let's say. Tiferes is a harmony, is the mix of the, the extreme of chesed and gevura. Then you have netzach, which is victory and perseverance, competitiveness. And then the opposite side, uh, hoid, which is humility. And then uh, yisoid, is the, which means foundation, is a combination of the two. And then you have malchus, the concept of leadership, of kingship. It's kind of like... These, these, seven, these seven emotional attributes are kind of like um, when you shine light through a prism. You know you shine light through a prism? I, I love doing this with my kids. You shine one light, and then it, goes, it makes a rainbow, right? Seven distinct colors. And so this is, this is sort of like a, a visual that we can use that when God is, is dispensing, is expressing his infinite light towards the world, he does so in seven particular emotional ways, the seven emotional attributes that express the way God is interacting with us. So in other words, God interacts with us in sometimes in a way that I would consider very kind. God is being so kind to me. And there are other times that God is is expressing himself, and we look and we say, God is being very strict right now. God is, God is expressing uh, strength and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, judgment. And so uh, each of the each of the um, each of the uh, each of these particular uh, emotional attributes in Kabbalah is also represented by a color. So, for example, Chesed is considered the color white because of its sort of purity, just giving nature. Gevura is considered is is compared to the color red, which is about severity, of strictness, of, of intensity. And then Tiferes, which is the merging of the two, right, mercy we'll call it, is uh, represented by the color pink, which is a combination of white and red. 
And so when we, said, when we talked a few minutes ago about how your worldview is the colored glasses that you see the world through, well, these are, the, these are where the colors of that worldview actually come from. Are you more of a chesed soul? Are you more of a gevura soul? Are you more of a, of a giving soul? Or are you more of a, a strict justice sort of soul? And one of the things that we say is that in the same way that the menorah in the temple was made of one piece of gold but had seven branches, every single person in this world has all seven emotional attributes but has one that's sort of dominating. One is like the active force of the person. And so, for example, for example, we all have all seven, but one is sort of like the dominant way in us. Anyone ever, everyone ever look into like personality, uh, 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 like the Enneagram? Right? So in the Enneagram, it, it's that you're, that you're symbolized by a particular number, right? Not that you don't have the other aspects of emotion, but that you're sort of, uh, most represented by a particular number. What's well, a similar way uh, in expressing the emotional attributes, spiritual attributes in a person? We all have all seven ways in which we uh, interact with the world, but each one of us has a dominant force. And for the, for the sake of our discussion today, we're going to focus only on the first three. And so we find this in Jewish tradition as well. Abraham, Okay, let's talk about our, our ultimate forefathers. Abraham is represented, he's most distinguished for his attribute of what? Of chesed, of kindness. Why? Because Abraham always had his tent open on all sides. He welcomed everybody. He was an extrovert. He was tolerant of everybody. He even prayed for the sinners in Sodom and Gomorrah. He told God, please, don't destroy these people. He was all about the kindness. Isaac, his son, so in, in, in a certain degree, you could say that Abraham was, again, in spiritual context, was like the liberal. Not, again, not in the modern manifestation, but was liberal in the sense of, like, equality, every, you know, giving, all good and give. His son, Isaac, on the other hand, Yitzchak, was quite different. What do we know about Isaac? He was distinguished for gevura. He was an introvert. He never traveled far from his home. And what does it say that about his occupation? What was his occupation? Anyone remember? He dug wells. And not only did he dig wells, but he redug the wells of his father. In other words, in that sense, we could say that Isaac was the conservative, right? Because he was redeveloping and rehashing the things that his father had developed. He was conserving that which his father had created. And so Jacob, the, his son, represents Tiferes, the blending of the two. He was the integration of the kindness of Abraham and the might of Isaac. And so they each possessed, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all possessed all of the emotional attributes, but they each had one dominating force. So far, so good? And so each one of us functions in the same way. And by the way, we find this concept of, of classifying and, and designating people by their sort of emotional soul power all across the board in Judaism. So when Jacob is blessing his, his 12 tribes, the 12 children at the end of his life, he does so, he blesses them based on their spiritual attributes, their spiritual personality. When we open the Haggadah every year on Passover, we, who asks the questions? Right? Who, are the, who are the questions addressed by and to? The four children, the four sons. Why to the four sons? Because each of them has a different personality and a different manifestation of their spiritual needs that they represent, and so the answers that we give them have to be formatted accordingly. And so, by the way, as well, this is one of the reasons why if you open up the Talmud, you find such debates between two sides, right? In fact, one, one of the, uh, it's not just, it's just a bunch of rabbis arguing. No, it's not like that. Perhaps the most famous dynamic of dispute is Hillel and Shammai. And so they were both great friends who loved each other very much, but they had a hard time agreeing on virtually anything. 
Hillel tended much more so towards the sort of liberal approach, while Shammai was much more stringent in his observance, of, in, in, his, uh, his law, in his law classifications. And so the Talmud regards, though, both of them, what does the Talmud say about their, their conclusions? That they're both divrei eloikim chayim. They're both the words of the living God. And how could that be? How could they both be correct? So the soul of one school, Hillel, was rooted in chesed. That's where his, his, his soul was motivated, was predominantly seen in the scope of kindness. That attribute dominated his existence and dominated his rulings. The soul of Shammai was rooted in gevura, in severity, in strictness. And so, since these characteristics of chesed and gevura in Kabbalistic thought are seen as the right hand and the left hand, if you can see from an objective standpoint that right hand and left hand are both part of the same body, you can have divergent opinions and still come together if you recognize that they're from the same body that they're part of the same entity. And that's why Hillel and Shammai had a wonderful, loving relationship with each other, but never agreed on almost anything Jewishly. And so likewise, all of the differing opinions that you find amongst the sages, it's not because this is my opinion, this is your opinion, or it's just a bunch of recordings of rabbis arguing. It's not like that. It, there's a spiritual root that frames the perspectives of each of the individual sages. One can say yes and one can say no, not because one is right and one is wrong. You ever see the, the meme, the picture of two people standing on both sides and there's a number drawn on the ground? It's the number nine or the number six. Because one guy's on the one side, he says, no, it's 999. And the other guy's on the, on the side says, no, it's 666, six, right? Are they, who, which one's right, which one's wrong? Well, it's, there's, there's a more objective view. Each one is saying what's correct, but only according to their vantage point. And so, again, since Hillel and Shammai both realized that, that they, they recognized that it was all rooted in the search for truth, they were able to stay good friends. Now, when it comes to chesed, the concept of living liberally, let's call it, and gevura, the concept of preserving boundaries, okay, uh, there needs to be balance and integration, right? Neither the extreme right or extreme left is going to, is, is going to get us anywhere. A, a perfect example, if a parent, anyone have kids, right? If a parent is too giving, all the time, no boundaries set, just all give, 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 all chesed, chesed, chesed. How's that child gonna end out? Right, right exactly, right, he's gonna, he's, gonna be, he's gonna be raised as someone who's entitled, right? Give, 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 the child is not going to, and what about the opposite, the parent that is so restrictive and so, and so many rules and so many arbitrary disciplinarian uh, sorts of things, how's that child gonna be raised? Right, well, he's right. He's going to be stressed and he's going to be very unsupported. And he's going to act out, possibly. So as a parent, you know not to give, give, give all the time, hopefully. Although some of us probably watch parents are like, oh my gosh, all the time. This, right? We know not to be too giving, but also not to be too restricting. It's that healthy balance that we need to find. Well, it, it works kind of the same way for a society. So too many rules in a society leads to a totalitarian nightmare. Everything is restricted. Everything is governed. On the opposite end of the spectrum, though, a society that breaks down all boundaries, that where there are no rules, there are no boundaries, this leads to total chaos, to societal anarchy, and to disintegration of the society. And so while both extremes are detrimental and should be avoided, perhaps special attention should be given to the breaking down of boundaries, being too chesed, too much kindness, too much. And the reason I'd say so, consider, consider, and so we said Kabbalah is spiritual physics. So consider the law of entropy. Entropy means, entropy or disorder, the law of entropy means that disorder in a system will increase over time unless outside energy is added. Meaning, left to its own devices, things are going to go to disorder. Things don't build by themselves, things destroy by themselves. If left to its own devices, if you leave a building unmaintained, 
or if you leave any sort of structure unmaintained for too long, right, it doesn't get stronger, it gets weaker. And so this plays itself out in civilization as well, that unless it's held together by something, and unless it's founded upon something, unless it's sustained by something, the structure of civilization, the structure of boundaries in society will disintegrate. Entropy in this, right, it's easier to destroy than it is to build. And so in political parlance, what that means is that boundary breaking, liberalizing, is the natural flow of things. That's just the way that, left to its own devices, the current flows, unless specifically acted upon. And this is why, politically, the liberals of yesterday become the conservatives of today. What does that mean? Right, because, because the, again, the liberal policies of years ago, what was considered liberal 30 years ago, is now considered conservative because society has become so liberal. And a good example would be if Bill Clinton, for example, would try to run nowadays on his same 1992 platform, exactly the same, he'd be considered a conservative or, 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 a, or he'd have to run as a Republican. Be not because his policy has changed, but because the natural way in which society, in which the world works, is, is the disintegration of boundaries. And so as, as boundaries are broken, which means liberalism, openness to more, uh, gets, gets more and more proliferated, that's the natural flow of how things, of how things go, unless acted upon. We find this in the Bible as well, a very interesting little story uh, that maybe, maybe we kind of glance over. It was a few weeks ago in the Torah portion. And so in the Torah portion, it says that the Jewish people had become attached to the idol Baal Peor. Baal was one of the names of the idols. And it says that the Jews had become attached. Numbers 25.3. The Jews had become attached to the Baal. Now, the reason that that's so peculiar is because you know how you serve the Baal? You know how the Baal was, was worshipped? You defecate in front of it. You go number two in front of it. And it's such a disgusting thing. But yet the Jews at the time not only did it, they did it with gusto. The Talmud teaches us that they would uh, eat beets and drink beer in order that they could go more and serve better. And every, each person tried to innovate over the next one to serve in the best and most beautiful sort of way. So the question is, the question that any reasonable person asks, is how is it that the Jews, we're not stupid people, how is it that the Jews became engrossed in this, attached to this form of idol worship? Not only idol, but like the most disgusting breath. So the reason that they became ensconced in it, so Rabbi Chaim Shmulevitz in his Sichas Musser, he says that the essence of Baal worship is not about the going number two, not about the defecating itself, but he says that the idea of Baal worship is to degrade and humiliate, to tear down all moral and religious restrictions. The more disrespectful you are to societal norms, the better your worship. And so, of course, we can sadly see the modern application of Baal worship. While nobody seems to bow, actually, to this idol today, it seems that the, the more disorder, the more boundaries you're willing to break, the more you want to disconnect yourself from uh, tradition and boundaries and norms of the past, the more you're celebrated. And so things that would have been considered unthinkable or disgusting or, or terrible years ago, is now seen as a necessary staple for the new society. It's as though each person is trying to outdo the next in breaking down the next set of norms. And so too many rules, whether you're talking in parenting or in a society, too many rules, too many boundaries, too much givura doesn't work, doesn't lead to good results. And too much kindness also, too much boundary no, lack of boundaries also doesn't work. Now, the, you, you find this in the, in the extremes in the Torah that the, that the outcomes, right? So Abraham, who's 
the pure manifestation of kindness, of, of boundarylessness, prays for everybody, welcomes everybody, he is incomplete. He has a son, somebody said it before, named Ishmael. Ishmael goes on the wrong path. Ishmael is not, is not something. He's described as a wild person. Isaac, the same thing. He's, he's on the extreme in Gevura. Too many rules, too, that too, many, too, too rigid. And he, the outcome of that, he, has, he also has a son named Asav. Asav is described as a thief and a murderer. So Jacob represents harmony, a sense of completion, the sense of truth, where there's an actual synthesis that is made, and all 12 of his children are considered uh, all righteous. Now, now that we've seen the contrast, okay, we said political, political affiliation is based on personality, personality to worldview, worldview to spiritual uh, dominating force. I want to talk a little bit about um, the concepts, again, of liberalism and conservatism from a Torah vantage point. Again, this is not the modern iterations or manifestations. These are the concepts as they exist in the spiritual realm. And in the spiritual realm, both are considered good and necessary, liberalism and conservatism in their spiritual root. Again, not necessarily in their modern manifestations. We're not here to talk about the different squabbles between Republicans and Democrats or the inter-squabbles between one side of the Republicans and the other side or one side of the Democrats and the other. We're not, don't put any, but conceptually, where does this concept of liberalism and conservatism come from? So liberalism is focused on the future. Is focusing on making a better future. They may even refer to themselves as progressives. It's all about progress, all about building a bridge to tomorrow, what's going to be for the future. And so what stands behind their thinking is not necessarily connected with the past. It's that we are now not complete. We need to make something new, make something different. Conservatives, on the other hand, are primarily focused on what? The past, right? They're conserving something. They're conserving something, which means that they, they recognize that if you assess the past in a proper way, that can give you insight to the present and the future. Now, if the conservative looks only to the past and the liberal looks only to the future and the liberal and, 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 uh, and not to the past, then they stand back to back. They have nothing that they're sharing. They face a very different direction. That's where conflict and opposition come into play. So how does one fix this? You have to find balance between rooting oneself in established foundations of the past and applying it appropriately to a changing present and future. Now, interestingly enough, if you were to say, what's the theme, what's the ideology of liberalism? It's all about equality, making an equal playing field for all, which has a lot of, of conceptually, a lot of good, right, in, in theory. There's a lot of, so equality is the, the main factor that motivates it. Um, uh, conservatism, on the other hand, is about hierarchy and structure. Right? It's about that there's a, there a top-down model, there's institutions, uh, that, that's, that's, the preserve, that's what we're trying to preserve. So again, if you want to define liberalism, it's about equality. The focus is on equality, making all equal. And conservatism is about hierarchy. It's about preserving traditions. It's about preserving that, that our, we can learn from the past and that our present should be predicated on our ancestors and the past, right? And so we find a very similar, we find a very similar sort of contrast in the Torah. Before the giving of the Torah, right, we, we find both the concept of equality and hierarchy emphasized in the Torah. Everyone, on the one hand, is called... Is, is created in the image of God. We're all equal. Everyone's equal. We're all created in the image of God. And at the same time, the, the, uh, they clearly find in the Torah the idea of hierarchy. There's Kayan, Levi, and Yisrael. There are parents and, and, and children. There are teachers and students. And there's a certain degree of, of, of authority that's given in a hierarchical model. So again, the Torah is about expressing equality, right? We're all equal, we're all created in the image of God, but there's also an idea of hierarchy, right? That there's levels and gradations, there's respect and authority. What's interesting, one might think of liberalism, which is embodied as equality, think about it as a horizontal line, okay? We're all equal. 
And think about conservatism conceptually, as be, like hierarchy, as, as described as a, a vertical line, right? A vertical line where there's, where there's higher and lower. And, and the truth is that the, the, ultimate, the ultimate manifestation of hierarchy is the giving of the Torah, giving of the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai, where the ultimate authority right, gives a top-down model of commandments to those below. He unites the above and the below. So again, liberalism is, 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 is uh, defined by equality, a horizontal line, conservatism, hierarchy, a vertical line. And what's interesting is that the first word of the Ten Commandments, what's the first commandment in the Ten Commandments? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. The word that's used is anochi, I am Hashem your God. But the same word anochi, vowelized differently, becomes anachi, which means what? Vertical. And so the basis, the fundamental of what was instilled at Mount Sinai is this vertical hierarchical model uh, given to the world. Yet, at the same time, by the way, as Jews were always aspiring for the future, we're always aspiring for Mashiach, where the way in which Mashiach is described, the Messi Messianic times are described, in this coming week's Haftorah, by the way, Shabbat Chazon, this week's Haftorah, look for it, how does it describe the future? It describes the future, the prophet describes, every valley shall be raised and every mountain shall be lowered. Equality, horizontal. And so you have both of these factors Kabbalistically embedded in creation, in reality. And the idea, the goal, is finding a balance uh, in, this, in this model of thinking. And so, uh, again, when, when, God is, when God creates the world, he does so in a way that, that combines both of these two extremes, liberalism and conservatism, uh, kindness and justice. It, you know, in God's, God has many different names that are used in the Bible, in Hebrew. And each name conveys a certain one of these attributes. And so the name of Yud with a He and above and a He, right, the, what we call the Tetragrammaton, is uh, the God's proper name, is all about giving, all about kindness, all about God as he is removed from all strictures of the universe. God is his beyond time and space. So it's the breaking of boundaries, it's God, describing God in the sense of chesed, of giving, of kindness. The name Elohim, on the other hand, represents God as God expresses himself as manifest in the workings of creation, the limitations of this physical universe. And yet, what's interesting in the book of Genesis, in the recapitulation of creation, in, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, what does it say? It says in Hebrew that on the day that Hashem Elohim, both, both names, in the, the day that Hashem Elohim made the heavens and the earth. Why does it use both names? Well, it's, the Torah is telling us that the world wasn't created only on kindness or only on stricture, on justice and judgment. It's a combination of the two. It's a combination of both. And without, with one extreme or the other, the world could not maintain if God didn't put any boundaries, creation, everything would just disintegrate. There'd be no civilization. If everything was only boundaries and only ju judgment according to everything tit for tat, none of us would also be able to, uh, to maintain because of the way that you know, we're, we're sinful people. And so it has to be a balance between both extremes in order to make sense, in order to make a reality function in a proper way. And so this pattern... This pattern is also, interestingly enough, embedded in creation as well. Each of the seven days of the week correspond with one of the seven emotional attributes. What was created on the first day of creation was the creation of, uh, of light, right? What is light? Just this boundless flow of divine bounty, right? Chesed, a boundless, no, no limitation, just light. What was created on the second day of creation? The second day of creation represents gevura, represents stricture, where God separates the upper waters from the lower water. It's about limitations. It's about restriction. 
And it's interesting that on the second day of creation, the creation model, God does not say, and it was good. Because that was the day of creation, of restriction, of separateness. What happens on the third day of creation? God confines the waters to the sea and uncovers the dry land. And now that allows the creation of vegetation, which came later on that day. And what does it say on the third day of creation? Tov, right? It was, it was good. God says it twice because it's the synthesis of unbound light and energy with combined restriction where each thing has its place. The waters go here. The land goes here. Each place has its own. Uh, it all functions together in a, in a symbiosis. That's where beauty lies. Not getting rid of one or getting rid of the other, but putting them together in a way where both, are, both expressions are able to come out in a thorough way. There is thesis, there is antithesis, and then there's synthesis. And although in political discussion, the desired resolution is not really a synthesis, which would just dull both opinions, uh, it, it should be a, a third category which incorporates the other two. Right? So, to, for example, Tiferis, this, this balance is not the Democrats saying, we want to spend $3 trillion on a certain cause, and the Republicans saying, well, we only want to spend $1 trillion on that cause, and they both decide to meet in the middle of $2 trillion. That's not, that's not pro because then neither one of them really get what they want or accomplish the goal. And so, Tiferis means that they discuss and they validate each other's view, viewpoints and arrive at a conclusion in which everyone gets what they want and provides for their perceived needs. And so uh, here's a good example, practical, practical tip. Okay, let's say there's a homeless man on the street and the liberal, the chesed soul, might empathize with this homeless man and say, we should feed him, okay? Seems like a reasonable thing to say. The conservative, the gvura soul, right, with, with boundaries and structure, might stress that feeding him daily, if we just come back every day and he's going to become reliant on us, it's going to prolong his status as a homeless person. And so the conservative might approach the homeless person and say, let me get him a job. Let me help him, right, learn to fish, learn a skill, work get be able to develop your own food and so they might so you have both both giving sort of reasonable approaches and so the the tiferous model of approaching the homeless person is combining both of them feed him today because he's hungry today and at the same time teach him a skill necessary that he won't have to ask for the fish tomorrow, that he won't have to ask for the lunch tomorrow. You can have your cake and eat it too. It doesn't have to be one or the other. Give or restrict. It can be give now so that you can restrict later. That's building a bridge. That is combining the two. If you, if you, if you re resort back to your original state, you wind up with, with sort of like a mishmash of nothing. And so the premise of Tiferes uh, is the balance of two seemingly opposite forces, kindness and structure, that can be united when, how do they unite? When they are done towards a unifying goal. If you find a goal, if the unifying goal is revealed, then we can start agreeing on something. When chesed, when right hand and left hand uh, uh, realize that they're part of the same body, when we realize that we're part of the same body, then that's when, that's when the magic happens. So it's only when we can see what the underlying goal is that right and left, that conservative and liberal, can come together. But there has to be a unified goal. Without the unified goal, the process doesn't work. The process, the process begins when both sides begin to discuss goals and develop goals for the country that they can both support. The mutually agreed upon goals, uh, they, they, would, uh, they would form the basis of a national strategic agenda to achieving said goal. 
okay? And the way in which we influence our destiny, that we can have the same goals, is by getting back to the roots of what our founding is about. If we don't understand our history, we won't understand our destiny. If we can't come together on our history, we are going to have trouble coming together on our destiny. And I think this is where a lot of the struggle in our current political system falls short. We're having, we're having trouble lately uh, coming together even on our own history, and so that's going to translate itself in coming in very divergent ways in our destiny as well. T. Ferris assumes that the right hand and the left hand can, can come together. They can agree. They can say that we need each other because we're part of the same body. However, in political parties, if you can't agree on where you come from, on what our, or what our foundation is, if we can't agree, then the idea of finding balance becomes much more of a pipe dream. We got to get rooted in who we are, what makes us, what is the body, what is the structure. We can have varying opinions, but we have to be able to agree on what the foundation, what the structure, what the body looks like. American history is filled, even in recent history, with stories of success in united goals. When we have a goal, if you have a goal-first process, we're filled with success. That's why uh, once, the, once Democratic President Bill Clinton and Republican House Speaker Newt Gingrich, once they agreed upon the shared goal of balancing the federal budget, they got it done. Similarly, when Republican President Ronald Reagan and Democrat House Speaker Tip O'Neill, when they were able to find some common ground and goals, and as their, and, and as their mutual desire was to, to make the tax code more simple and fairer, they got it done. Once they agreed on the objective, they created a bipartisan coalition that enacted one of the most comprehensive tax reforms in U.S. history. When we are goal-oriented, when that is the center, when that is what grounds us, we can figure out a perspective from both our varying views that gets it done in an effective way. Unfortunately, over the past 20 years, at least, the cohesiveness and the pride in our national identity has waned, and the goals which our political parties seek are becoming more and more divergent. It becomes very difficult to have a reasonable discussion uh, uh, when, uh, when certain basic premises and criteria can't even be agreed upon. And so when you don't share a history, it becomes quite difficult to share a destiny. We must strengthen our connection with our nation's founding and come together to set common goals together. And in this, it's my hope as well as I'm sure it's all of your hope, in this we, have, we can have a discussion and we can come to the Tiferes conclusion and ultimately not have my perspective and your perspective, but bring back the we of we the people. Thank you very much. The Roar Jewish Learning Institute has the largest collection of Jewish media online. Hit subscribe for more.